Andy brubaker Kaitler is Associate Professor of Christian Formation and Culture at AMBS. He received bachelor's degrees from Canadian Mennonite Bible College and the University of Waterloo, a master's degree from the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, and his PhD from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Chicago. Before coming to AMBS in 2003, he was Minister of Youth Ministries for Mennonite Church Eastern Canada, and he's also served as a congregational pastor. At AMBS, he began our Explore program that encourages youth to explore different forms of Christian ministry. He's also the director of the Center for Faith Formation and Culture. We'll hear a bit about those different roles during our time today. Andy's going to start by answering several questions I have prepared for him. And after that, we'll have time for your questions and comments. And again, remember you can submit those at any time using the Q&A feature. Thank you, Andy, for joining us today. What would you like to tell us about yourself as an introduction? Uh, well, one thing is that I am really happy today. Um, the sun set in the west last night and it rose in the east this morning and in between the Canadian women's hockey team beat the American women's hockey team. So some things are still in order in the cosmos and, uh, and that feels good. Uh, maybe in addition to the introduction that, that Janine offered, um, I could add that I have two young adult daughters, uh, both of whom are living in Ontario right now. That might change soon, but for now, they're there. And uh, my wife teaches here in Elkhart County uh, at a school between Elkhart and Goshen. Uh, she teaches third grade at a, at a public school. So um, our whole family lives are... Uh, taken up with uh, with education right now at this point, um, and that's generally a very good a very good thing. Thank you, Andy. Um, can you tell us a story about a time when you experienced God in a powerful way? Um, I don't know if I can distill it to one story. There are two contexts where I regularly um, experience God powerfully. One is in nature, and especially when I'm canoeing, um, and I have lots of experiences of encountering God on rivers in mid and north Michigan and Algonquin Park in Ontario, um, especially uh, in the evenings when there are loons calling from Lake to lake, um, I find God to be very present then. Uh, another way that I encounter God is by witnessing um, kind of the confluence of energy and attention that happens when young people hear, discover, and respond to a call in their lives, and especially um, a call to serve God in, in some way. So if there was a story I'd, I'd like to tell, it would be, um, story of a young woman who participated in the Explore program in one of its early, early years. She came from a relatively conservative Mennonite congregation, and her father was pretty convinced that women were not called to ministry, but she personally felt this call that this was something she at least needed to explore. Uh, and at a Mennonite convention, she was invited to uh, help participate in an anointing service. And her father was also at that convention and he had to choose, was he gonna go and stand in the line and be anointed by his daughter or was he gonna go and stand in another line where there was a man doing the anointing? And he chose to stand in the line and be anointed by his daughter. Uh, even though he didn't, he didn't quite believe that uh, women were called to ministry, he believed in, in his daughter and, and he trusted her. And that story still, uh, kind of brings a welling up of emotions for me um, because she went on then to study and become a pastor in Florida and um, has continued to do, I think, great work for the church. I, she's not pastoring in a Mennonite church right now. She's at a Methodist church, but um, I think this is just a wonderful example of how God uses um, Hannah's and Elkanah's parents 
um, uses Eli's and Elizabeth's church leaders um, who call and foster young people. And God continues to call um, Samuel's and Samantha's to serve God in in ministry formally in the church and in lots of other lots of other ways. Thank you. Those are great stories. You've been at AMBS a little longer than many of our current teaching faculty. I'm wondering if you can tell us what first attracted you to be part of the AMBS community and and maybe you want to add what what keeps you excited about being here? Sure. Uh, I very clearly remember the moment that I first thought about um, coming to AMBS to work here. Uh, I was at a youth ministry council meeting in Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, on a particularly cold April day in Manitoba. Um, and Janine, or sorry, Jewel uh, Ginrich Longnecker was there and passed around a job description uh, for a position that was opening up at the seminary to, um, to work with this new youth program called Explore and to do some teaching. And I looked at that and I thought, oh my goodness, I could not have written a better job description for myself if I had tried. So I was so excited. I went back to Ontario. And as soon as my wife picked me up at the airport with our two very young daughters at that point, I told her about this opportunity. And apparently, in hindsight, after abandoning your family for six days, um, this is not a good time to propose to your wife that you move to the United States. Um, when you're very happily um, settled and working in southern Ontario. Uh, but that's what I did, because uh, I did not have the benefit of hindsight. And she thought for a moment and she said, there is not an ice cubes chance in hell we are moving to the US. And that was it. Uh, I didn't think about it for a very long time until somebody sent me a letter saying, hey, you should um, you should think about this. And uh, my wife was pretty convinced I had put somebody up to this. Um, we knew who the, the letter was coming from. Anyway, long story short, uh, we ended up here in Elkhart. We've been here for, for 18 years. So I think I was drawn to the seminary originally because of the youth program. This is not something that seminaries are known for doing is programming with youth. And that really excited me. There was the opportunity to get a PhD, which I had wanted to do. Uh, and to teach. And these, um, I still believe my call, first and foremost, has been to serving the church, the Mennonite church in Canada and the U.S. And uh, this just seemed to be a good kind of continuation uh, of that call in other contexts for doing it. Um, what do I enjoy about being here? And why do I stay? I'm just really drawn to the way, as a seminary, we are not perfect at, but intentional about integrating spirituality and academics and discipleship and leadership development um, all through community life, both the on-campus community and the community that's created for the Connect students, um, especially when we meet together online or uh, when students are all here together for our intensive weeks. Um, and I'm still part of the seminary because I really believe AMBS is serving Mennonite Church USA and Mennonite Church Canada, as well as Mennonite churches all across the globe. Um, I believe we are serving them uh, well, and I look forward to continue to be to being part of that. Andy, you have a, a lot of different roles at AMBS, so I'd like you to take some time to talk about the different things that you do. So if you'd start by describing the courses that you're teaching this year, both in the fall and now in this semester, and then if you would talk about some of your administrative roles, the different projects you're working on, and then if you'd also like to talk about uh, your research interests and what wh how those are interacting with your work right now, um, that that will take a while to do. But I'd like to give you opportunity to kind of describe each of those things. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, one of the courses that I am teaching uh, that I taught last semester is a course that's been on the books at AMBS for quite some time. Uh, called God's Shalom and the Church's Witness. Um, 
before I was teaching it, Melinda Berry was teaching that course. She had done a fair bit of work and uh, kind of reshaping it. And I really appreciate the way that that she set up the course. So I've tried to continue it a lot in the way that that she had set it up. Um, I teach the on-campus version of this course in James Craybill, uh, formerly from my Mission Network, teaches the online version of the course. Uh, the class looks at what the Kingdom of Shalom looks like for those who are working in the church and in communities around the church, working towards healing political divisions, towards addressing environmental crises, towards healing racial divisions, and towards becoming more radically inclusive congregations. Um, so that course I really enjoy teaching. Uh, a course that's going on right now is called Capstone. This is the, a third year course in, um, in the ministry formation sequence for MDiv students. So this is kind of the, the last course where we try to bring things, bring things together, reflect on, synthesize, learning and growth during the time that students have been studying at AMBS. Uh, this is a course that uh, culminates in senior interviews. I think senior interviews have been going on for a long time. Um, and this is, uh, I just really wish that every person who works at AMBS, every faculty member could be part of these senior interviews and part of this class just to hear the, the incredible stories of students learning and growth during their, during their, time, during their time here. Um, it's just, it's a real blessing. And I'm just constantly amazed at how um, students are able to kind of articulate very concrete, specific things that they've learned from um, certain professors, certain classes, books, interactions on campus, experiences in their congregations. Um, yeah, that, it's just a real joy to be part of that class. In fact, I teach it twice a year, once in the um, semester one, once in semester two, and uh, it is, it just never gets old. Another class that I am teaching uh, coming up in May and June is called History of Christian Spirituality. Uh, by now, I think this is one of the, if not the only kind of purely history courses that we teach at, at AMBS. And by history, I mean, a, a course that takes one topic and kind of covers it chronologically. Uh, we still have Anabaptist history and theology um, and Christian theology one courses like that. Um, but this one has, this one has is, is been really uh, fun for me to teach. I have always been interested in spirituality. Uh, it is a topic that is simultaneously very, very old, uh, but relatively new to Anabaptists. I keep thinking if I had asked my grandparents what spirituality was, I'm not sure what they would have said. I think they might've said that's something that Catholics do. Um, but not knowing much about it. And yet when I look at the lives of um, grandparents on both of my uh, parents' side, uh, they were deeply spiritual. Uh, they had very regular spiritual practices that they engaged in that were really important. They just didn't call it that. Uh, so it's been really exciting for me to be able to kind of dig deeper into the history of spirituality um, before we started to use that term. And I recognize that I am standing on the very broad shoulders of people like Marlene Krupp and Marcus Smucker who went before and who kind of helped us as, not just as a seminary, but the whole Mennonite church uh, take seriously the discipline of Christian spirituality. Uh, one of the classes, probably the class that I've taught the most often and for the longest is a class called Faith Formation and Spirituality of Youth and Young Adults. Um, I taught that one last fall. And uh, this class combines uh, human development, so stage of life issues with spiritual formation and faith formation, also taking into account cultural, uh, cultural influences. So despite the fact that I am well into my 50s uh, and I am no longer the jean wearing guitar playing youth pastor that I was many, many years ago, I'm still very deeply interested in faith formation and think that faith formation among in the teen years, adolescent years 
is so, so incredibly important. And I lament at times the ways our, our uh, regional churches, denominations seem to have, um, I wouldn't say forgotten, but there's less emphasis on youth ministry in the church now. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be um, still involved in that in different ways, both in my home congregation, Belmont Mennonite Church, I'm actively involved there in uh, youth and also here at the seminary through the Explore program and courses like this. Uh, those are the courses I have on the go right now. Um, I have uh, quite a few administrative responsibilities as well. I am the director of the MDiv program here. So I give some oversight to the uh, programmatic um, curricular parts of the MDiv program. I'm also the director of the MACF, the Master of Arts in Christian Formation program here. Um, Janine mentioned I'm director of the Center for Faith Formation and Culture, which is um, the center under which the Explore program falls. I'm the co-editor of the Vision Journal. Uh, Carl Coop from Canadian Mennonite University is the new uh, co-editor from the CMU side of things. And I'm working right now with Jane Kipfer from uh, Connor Grable University College and University of Waterloo um, to edit the, the next issue of Vision. Uh, not the one that's in print right now, but the one that will be in print in the fall on um, spirituality and aging. That's a really exciting uh, issue that I think that's coming out soon. I uh, am the assistant director at the Institute of Mennonite Studies. Jamie Pitts is the director there. So as you know, this is the kind of the winger part of AMBS that does, that does publishing. We have a number of uh, interesting projects on the go uh, now at IMS. And I also work uh, with Janine and Rachel on the uh, campus care group. Um, so I provide a little bit of pastoral care for students on campus here. So yeah, I'm, I'm finding my life is full uh, with both teaching and administrative responsibilities. Was there another question, Janine? Um, would you like to go ahead and talk about some of your research interests, ah. some of those projects that you're um, spending time on? Right, yeah. So uh, part of my work through Institute of Mennonite Studies is to um, help prepare for and plan a conference called Reading the Bible After the Holocaust. Uh, you will probably not hear about this conference in the media and the press. We are, um, in some ways, it's a follow up to the Bethel College conference, Mennonites in the Holocaust, from uh, about five years ago. Um, but we're trying to, we're shaping it, running it fairly differently. It's going to be in a by invitation conference, a lot smaller, maybe 30 to 40 participants. And we're really looking to invite an uh, equal number of Jews and Mennonites and to develop kind of like dialogue partners, dialogue groups, uh, so that we can focus on what it means to read um, the Bible together. We share portions of what Christians call the Bible, um, and we share portions with our Jewish sisters and brothers. Uh, and then there are there are parts that are more you that are more unique to us. And I think that the main um, objective of the conference is to help us as Christians um, and Mennonites in particular pay attention to the ways that we have been formed to read Scripture um, anti-Semitically. So just to be aware of that so that we can change our reading of some texts. Um, but the other part is just, I think we can, uh, Jews and Mennonites together can really, um, we can really enrich each other's um, understanding just of what scripture, of what scripture means. I had the opportunity uh, four years ago to go to Israel and Palestine with a program called Partners for Peace that was initiated by the World Jewish Federations um, and that was just, a, that was a really important trip. Um, it was the first time I was really exposed to, um, uniquely or explicitly Jewish ways of reading Christian texts. And so we were, you know, went to the Jordan river to the place that is now pretty touristy, but where, uh, Jesus was baptized by John, it's believed to be that place historically, uh, lots of other places reading these scriptures that were very familiar to me. Uh, but also hearing Jewish scholars reflect on them and, and what it, what they meant from a Jewish perspective. So 
I'm really excited about this conference. I'm doing lots of learning. Theologically, it has kind of um, shaken or um, dislodged me a little bit from some of my strong held Christocentric uh, beliefs. Uh, I'm still quite Christocentric, uh, but this doing the reading and preparing for this conference has helped me just be more aware of the ways that um, in, in my own self and my own family history, perhaps our Christocentric discipleship emphasis might um, might contribute to some anti-Semitic sentiments or attitudes, feelings, um, or statements. So I'm just continuing to become more and more aware of that. Yeah, thanks for the question, Janine. Um, we already have one question from an alum that seems to fit in really nicely here. Uh, Doug Umstutz is saying that the history of Christian spirituality class sounds very interesting to him and wondering if you could say a little bit more about that and also has AMBS made connections with the Center for Action and Contemplation um, and how are we how are we including contemplative and mystic practices? Thank you, Doug, for that question. Yeah, so the um, as a as a history class, the this class focuses more on developing themes of Christian spirituality from um, the time of the early church to the contemporary time. We have other classes on campus. We call them sp um, spiritual practices classes that focus more on specific practices on the doing of these practices. Uh, this course focuses more on the, the history and the development of these practices. We have not made a formal connection with the Center um, for Action and Contemplation. This would be uh, very interesting. There would be some possibilities there, I, I imagine. Um, many folks here are familiar with Richard Rohr and, and uh, his work and the work of the Center. Uh, but in this course, we don't explicitly make those make those connections. Uh, in preparing for the course this year, one of the points of connections that I'm working um, at developing and expanding a little bit is some, some of the other global connections. So the history of Christian spirituality is often taught in a very Western oriented um, way. And so what I'm trying to pay attention to a little bit more uh, this time around is like the African, especially North African origins of spirituality uh, and the ways that um, this common history of Christian spirituality, if you want to call it that, actually may not be so common and was received and taken uh, in many different directions. Um, so even, even the Western story is not simply one story. There was um, Western Christianity, Eastern Christianity, Orthodox, um, lots of different versions of this. So I'm trying to um, pay a little bit more attention to kind of the global and the non-linear um, way that Christian spirituality has, has developed. Thanks. And another question has come in that also is about courses, so I'm going to go with it. Um, you mentioned that one of your courses talks about being a radically inclusive church. What does that look like in our time and space right now? Thank you, Mark Diller-Harder, for that question. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as we are all aware, the um, Mennonite Church Canada, Mennonite Church USA, and lots of other denominations in North America and around the world are um, in at some level thinking about what it means to be an inclusive congregation. I attend uh, Belmont Mennonite Church and we have just as a congregation decided that we are going to be openly, explicitly inclusive. Um, the way we're talking about it is inclusive of people of all um, sexual orientations, gender identities, socioeconomic statuses, races, ethnicities. Um, I think those are the categories, the main categories that we're, that we're using there. Um, and I think so in a class like God Shalom and the Church's Witness, um, I, we, we are focusing especially on sexual orientation and gender I identities and what it means to become a more inclusive church more broadly. Um, I would say this is uh, in the last five years, but especially in the last couple of years, uh, a 
a conversation that is in some ways a lot more on the surface at the seminary and in many congregations. Uh, we have quite a few students here who would identify as LGBTQ. And so I am learning from them um, along the way about what it means to be an inclusive congregation. And pretty much on a daily basis, I'm challenged in some way to, to rethink a uh, assumptions that I have had um, or prejudices that I might carry um, or just ways that I'm ignorant um, about what it means to be what it means to be inclusive. So in this particular class, this is one of four uh, four topics that gets explicitly uh, explicitly addressed. And um, I, I think it's really exciting that we're at a time and place in the church where um, where in many places we are moving in that direction. Uh, but this this is a conversation that's been happening for a very long time, and it will probably continue to happen. Uh, for a very long time, but I do feel hopeful and optimistic that there's been a slight, um, slight turning of corners in generally in acceptance of especially LGBTQ persons in the church um, and other ways of of inclusion. And maybe by radical, I would say that I by radical I mean full participation in the church, not just not just being present there or being represented numerically, but inclusion of gifts of people, not necessarily because of their um, difference, um, not in spite of their difference, but, be, but because of their difference, recognizing that, they, that their identity brings something really important to the life of the church. Thanks, Mark. Andy, I wanna uh, ask another question about a course that you're not teaching this year. But um, just recently, we asked some of our alums what, what were the most significant courses they took at AMBS. And one that got mentioned more than any other course was cultural hermeneutic, which you have kind of been the champion for. And I, I'm wondering if you could describe a bit of what you do in that course. And second, why you think it has been so important for our alums that say this was like, one of the key courses that shaped them? And third, is that course ever offered in a format that our own alumni who didn't have the option of taking it could audit it, sit in on it? I don't know if it's one of those courses that's available for us, uh, um, an alum audit or not, but would you share a little bit more about that course? Because I think it's one of the courses that you are really especially identified with. Yeah, yeah, no, that is, um, I shouldn't say, it's one of my favorite courses because courses are like children. They're all your favorite. And, um, but it is a course that I developed from scratch. And the story is that um, many years ago, um, um, I was asked to teach philosophical theology. And so I developed this course and all of a sudden I realized, oh, well, I was building on a course that was already being taught. Um, that Gail had taught for many years, Gail Gerber Coons. Um, and then when I wanted to kind of do my own things with it, I realized this is way, way, way too much uh, for a course. So I divided it into, and the first half was called philosophical theology and the second half was called cultural hermeneutics. Uh, and so the basic um, point of the class is to use some of the, the philosophical movements, especially in the West, but not only in the West um, that have shaped culture and um, and how we engage in the culture. And I think for me, the main objective of this course is to help us all realize uh, that when we read the Bible, when we read scripture, when we think about our faith, we, or we come with culturally derived or at least culturally influenced questions. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, believe, I don't see that we ever really just read the scripture for what the scripture says on its own. We're always interpreting in our interpretation, right from the questions that we bring to the text to what we hear the text say back to us is always shaped by culture. And I just, I believe that we needed to pay more attention, attention to this. I should say that my, my earliest interest in something like cultural hermeneutics, I didn't call it that then, but was when I was a a pastor in the 90s. And I felt that my job as a pastor was to encourage young people to consider the ministry 
um, to take leadership in the church. And I had a few parents that would, after a while, kind of take me out for lunch or something like this and say, I'm really glad you're in encouraging my kid, but my son or my daughter, they're not going to be a pastor. They're going to be X, Y, Z. So, you know, maybe you can just kind of lay off on the Bible college theology thing a little bit, right? And, and I didn't know where this was coming from. And I thought, well, shouldn't this, isn't this what Christian formation is about, is about encouraging young people to take their faith seriously. Um, so that's when it kind of got me thinking, there are some really powerful forces here that make um, Christian formation and living what I would call like a gospel centered life that make it really challenging. And I decided I needed to learn more about that. Um, and for whatever reason, I thought philosophy was a good way to get into that because I think philosophy talks about the kinds of things that are operative in societies, but not necessarily things that we talk about on a daily, on a daily basis. So I wanted to bring these kind of philosophical tools, especially uh, postmodern theology, critical theory, um, um, literary studies, uh, things like that to, um, to reading, use those tools to read culture itself, and then to help us understand how as Christians, our own attitudes or questions or ways of approaching the text, especially the Bible, are, um, are, shaped by, are shaped by culture. So I think what students really like about this class is that we, we spend about two thirds of the class um, exploring different approaches or cultural hermeneutical tools. And then students have an opportunity to uh, pick two or three of them and apply them to a topic of their choice. So we have had just a huge variety of just super, super interesting projects, things that um, students have talked about. I mean, and I learn every time students do these projects and presentations, I learn so much about um, anything from, you know, metrosexuals to uh, polyamory to um, uh, like um, uh, diff different kinds of uh, comics or zombies. Um, so sometimes it has to do with media, TV shows, but there's so many themes way, uh, way beyond that. Uh, and it's just, yeah, it is a really fun course to teach. And it warms my heart to hear that, that students also enjoy it and appreciate it. Uh, is it available online? Yeah, my, my preferred way of teaching is not online. And so this is one course that, um, that I offer only on campus. It is auditable for people who are around um, and are close, and are close by. Uh, but this one right now is only an on-campus on campus course. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you would uh, have a dream for AMBS that you'd like to share, or maybe two dreams. Yeah. Uh, well, one dream is, I mean, it's partly a reality, but I think it's like a yet and not yet kind of thing. And that is that the seminary would just continue to strengthen connections with Mennonite Church Canada, Mennonite Church USA, um, regional church bodies, and the global Anabaptist body. I think there's just something so incredible that happens when, when people, not just Mennonites, but people from all over the world, all over Canada and the U.S. kind of come together at this place and live in community, think theologically together, eat together, play together, challenge each other. Um, the, the atmosphere is just so is so wonderful. So I hope we can continue moving in that direction. Uh, I will say one of the things that's been a little harder for me being here as a Canadian is that um, I've lamented at times the fact that there aren't more Canadians that come to seminary here. I realize there's uh, lots of other really good places in Canada where um, Canadians can can get their education. And as somebody who crosses the border regularly, I totally understand why that border is as much of a psychological barrier as it is uh, a physical a physical barrier. It's definitely definitely both, especially in these uh, pandemic years here. Um, but I, I really hope, and I'm optimistic about the future relationship of uh, the seminary with our denominational um, 
conference and regional church bodies. Uh, and I also, another dream I have is that we continue to pay attention to what it means to be a vibrant on-campus community that is radically inclusive um, for people of all races, nationalities, sexual orientations, uh, gender identities, and to use the words of uh, Clarence Jordan, who founded the Koinonia Farms, that we would continue to be a demonstration plot for the, for the kingdom for the kingdom of God. Um, I feel that that's happening and I think we can keep working to do it, to do it better and, and discover what that means. But that is another hope and dream, a yet, but not yet hope and dream I have for AMBS. Thank you. Uh, those of you who are on the webinar, I invite you to put your questions or comments for Andy in the Q&A feature and I have one more question that we've prepared ahead of time, and then we'll turn to yours if they're there. Um, and Andy, that last question from me is, do you have any questions for the alums who are here today um, that you would like to know more from, from them about? Yeah, I, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, like, I'm, I'm probably pretty normal. I go through cycles of hope and despair for the church, um, especially post-COVID, I am really, or as we move post-COVID, really curious and frankly, a little scared about who all will come back to church and who we will have lost in the meantime, um, because hanging out in our jammies and watching church online is just a little easier. Uh, that and lots of other issues. I'm with young adult uh, children. I realize how many, um, how many young adults are just opting not to return to church. Sometimes there are, sometimes they were hurt by church and sometimes it's just, it doesn't seem to be, doesn't have a, it's not compelling in their lives. Um, and then other times I'm filled with hope. So what I would like to hear from folks is like, what gives you hope? What are the signs of hope that you see in your congregations uh, in the places that you live and work for the future of the church? Uh, and maybe the second question then is, what would you like EMBS to think about as we train leaders for the important um, and ongoing work of addressing sexual abuse in the church? I um, think we're paying attention to it. I think we're realizing that maybe in the last uh, decade or so, we've done a decent job of helping leaders uh, be aware of their own boundaries, be, be self-aware, um, and work at avoiding situations um, where they are uh, tempted to um, abuse power uh, for their own sexual benefit. Um, I think where we're continuing to learn is what it means to lead a whole congregation when this happens, right? So what is it, how, how do you we process this when it's people in the congregation and you're called to pastor both um, victims and perpetrators, uh, things like that. So yeah, what would you like AMBS to think about as we train leaders for this important work of prevention, truth-telling, and justice when it comes to sexual abuse in the church? Hopes for the church, and what do we need to think about as we train leaders? Those are my questions. Thanks. Those are awesome questions. And uh, if you have an answer you wanna share, you can go ahead and use the chat feature for that and make sure you uh, send it to everyone so that all everyone who's here can uh, see that as well. Um, the first thing you talked about post COVID ties in really nicely with one of the questions that's come in from William Block. Thank you, Bill. And he asks, how are you dealing with the political divide in the US and the one coming in Canada as well? around COVID and freedom and where it strikes our democratic issues? Great question, thank you. Yeah, well, my mother and my sister and her family both live in Ottawa. Um, so I get regular daily updates on what the truckers are up to in the capital. One of the things I found really interesting is trying to uh, kind of discern and talk with people about what about this? What about these trucker protests in Ottawa and at the borders? What about it feels American and what is particularly Canadian? Um, so 
I mean, one of the things that does not feel American about it is that, at least as far as I know, I've heard nothing about guns or direct violence. Um, there have been some, a lot of social awkwardness in businesses that have had to close down and people refusing to move. Um, but it's been relatively peaceful. And even though that's annoyed people that live in those areas, uh, almost a carnival-like atmosphere, noisy, um, but not necessarily destructive. I understand the, uh, there was some conversation in the parliament in Canada yesterday, um, especially around political parties and allegiances and uh, things got a little bit more, uh, more heated there. Uh, but at least compared to like the January 6th protests in Washington, the protests in Ottawa have been a lot less violent. Um, and, you know, fewer, there, were, there are racist signs, anti-Semitic signs um, in Ottawa, but as a whole, uh, a lot less. I interestingly, uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and one of the one of the things that the presenter said there that I thought was interesting, I hadn't really thought about, is that the greater divide is probably not between right and left, or liberal and conservative, or Democrat and um, Republican, uh, but between those who are politically engaged and those who are not politically engaged. And the problem that they articulated was that if um, that those who are politically engaged um, and radicalized in some ways, both on the right and on the left, they're kind of setting the agenda for everybody. Um, and so this person was saying that the bigger divide is between those who are politically engaged and those who aren't. So as a as an Anabaptist, as a Mennonite, as a Christian, that makes me wonder, well, what does what does political engagement mean, right? If it doesn't mean, maybe it does mean protesting. And I've been to a few uh, protests. Um, but that's not the only thing that it means. So what does it mean to be politically engaged for a people who have historically been the quiet in the land, the people that try to um, work under the under the cover, under cover there. Yes, I saw Doug's comment there that there was a um, there were some guns um, retrieved or found in the um, at a border in, in Alberta. Um, but for the most part, that has not been a prominent part of of what's going on in the protests them, themselves, right? So Canada's not immune to it. Someone else has asked if you are still training for and running marathons. And so um, if if not that, what what are the things you like to do for physical exercise? Um boy. I'm curious where that, that question came from. I have never run a marathon. I used to run more than I do. I don't, I don't do that now. A number of years ago, I had a, uh, a pulmonary embolism and uh, DVTs in my legs and that kind of kiboshed. Uh, I was doing a lot of bike riding before then, and that also has been reduced my days of 60 mile or 100 kilometer day rides. Those are done. I can do... Uh, 20 miles now, 35 kilometers in a day. Um, I would say maybe partly just because I'm getting older, I'm finding more joy in walking and uh, hiking, things like that. Uh, and canoeing, of course, has uh, been just a standard um, uh, form of exercise for, for my wife and I. Um, so yeah, slightly slower, uh, slower things. Um, been doing a little bit more swimming up until COVID um, at a local uh, the local pool. That's been that's been good. My marathon days are behind me. Thanks, Patrick Obande asks, what are some of the ways in which the students' embodied faith and spirituality are considered integral to AMBS evaluation standards? Thank you, Patrick. Deep question there. Yeah, so one of the joys of uh, teaching the capstone course is that I get to ask this question and hear what students say about that. Uh, and there, uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, lots of varieties of, of approaches. So often students will come with practices that they are familiar with from their kind of places of origin, churches of origin, family of origin, 
And then at EMBS, we try to expand people's repertoire of, uh, of spiritual practices. And as you can imagine, some people really welcome this and some people find this an unnecessary hoop to jump through or box to check. Um, but at the end of the MDiv program, when students do capstone, almost all of the students express appreciation for the challenge of trying new, trying new disciplines. Uh, they are clear on what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And almost always they've added to their repertoire practices that, that they can use. Um, we also hear, uh, I don't know how long we've been using the language of knowing, being, and doing, um, at least since I've been here. So I think at least 20 years. Um, but I think we're doing a better job um, of trying to figure out what, what, what it means to integrate intellectual growth with, um, like with skills, things that we actually do with being itself. And the knowing, um, that one's easy to evaluate. The doing, a little harder, uh, but also evaluatable, uh, both self-evaluation and from a kind of a, a professor perspective. The being one is really hard to, to evaluate, yet it's the one that kind of undergirds the other two. Um, so I think we're, we're working out, you know, just thinking about what it means to evaluate being, how do we talk about that? Um, and in the kind of Venn diagram of knowing, being, and doing, right? Obviously, we want them to kind of come together as much as possible and overlap, recognizing they are somewhat distinct, um, but that they really um, they really affect each other in generally positive positive ways. So yeah, paying attention to the intersection of knowing, being, and doing, and trying to figure out what it is that we can actually evaluate and what it is that we leave up to the leave up to the spirit. Thank you. Remember that if you have a question or comment, you can put it in the Q&A there. Um, while we wait for some more from our alums, I will ask you, um, we were talking earlier about hermeneutics and you have um, demonstrated how much you're into this by having a sign on your door that talks about particular hermeneutics. And um, I don't know of anyone else who applies hermeneutics to every part of their life, but um, is this is this a, a, just a fun thing that you look for or did somebody else find that for you? Or how did you come about that sign? And maybe you'll need to describe the sign to those who haven't seen it. Oh yeah. so. The, the sign is called Particular Hermeneutics, How to Read a Door. So there was a, uh, there was a time, oh, seven or eight years ago when teaching faculty were encouraged to be a little bit more explicit and open about what, when they were in their office, when they were disturbable, when they needed to not be disturbed, things like that. So I had never heard of particular hermeneutics, particular, uh, but I was familiar with the term particular hermeneutics, right? So I just, that was a play on the, on the word. And um, I've, yeah, so it just, the, if the sign says, if the door is open, please interrupt me. If I'm working, it's open so that I can be interrupted um, or disturbed from what I'm doing. If the door is only open a crack, I likely am meeting with somebody uh, come back in 10 minutes, something like that. And if it's closed, it means I need some alone time or time that I'm not uh, interrupted from what I'm from what I'm doing. So uh, yeah, I've, lots of faculty do it in their in their own ways. But this has been especially important as our uh, the percentage of our student body that is from outside of the US and Canada grows and people from different cultural contexts they read doors differently, right? Um, what, what does it mean when a door is closed? And around here, we have offices that are in very heavily trafficked areas, noisier areas. So somebody might have a door closed, not because they don't wanna be disturbed, but because the hallway is noisy close to their office. So it's particularly important that we are explicit, clear about what it means when our door is um, stationed one way or another. 
Thank you. Now we're going to turn to a very heavy question. Uh, Chuck Newfeld is wondering how we can prepare for what looks like might be civil war coming. Should we have trainings about how we as Anabaptists committed to nonviolence can become more competent in how to respond when real conflict arises in our neighborhoods? Some days that reality seems all too close by. In other words, how can we prepare to be most creative and peaceful in our tactics? Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, this is a question I would love to hear from, from others too. Um, and I, I mean, I think we haven't asked it quite this way at EMBS. I suspect there are courses and the work that Jana Hunter Bauman, for example, does, um, I think would would address this. Um, one of the one of the ways I think we can be doing more is just by participating in the ministry of getting in the way. Um, so I know, at, at least in Elkhart and Goshen, there were groups of people who were who agreed to be on um, kind of text lists so that if an undocumented person was being arrested or something like that, there could be a group of people that would come and be a witness to this. Um, and so, I mean, I think there are things like that that are really great, simple examples, but they also require some kind of training. Um, and I know that there are kind of local trainings that happen and it's probably something the seminary should, um, should be a little bit more active and, um, and get involved with. Uh, in a class like God Shalom and the Church's Witness, uh, we, do, we do talk about this uh, a little bit more from the perspective of what it means to do some of this stuff as a congregation, right? Not just what does it mean to be an inclusive uh, congregation, but what does it mean to be a congregation that is advocating for economic justice, uh, racial justice, things like, things like that. Um, but in the face of civil civil war yeah I, I think this is a real a real a real live question one of the things that i have learned is um and this particular as a canadian moving here is just how to the amount of work it takes just to get to know your neighbors um and especially people that either you know because they've told you or you're pretty sure have pretty different social political uh, convictions. And so, you know, after we were here for a couple of years, we had a neighbor come over and say, oh, I heard you're a pacifist. So, um, but I just wanted you to know, you know, I'm an ex-Marine and I've got a gun. If you're ever in trouble, please give me a call. You know, I'll be happy to come over and help. And it's just like, I, I think at that point, my jaw just dropped and I didn't know how to respond. But this was a person then that I, that I got to know later and um, I think developing relationships is is hugely hugely important. So I have another neighbor that regularly makes reference to the fact that I'm a Democrat even though um, up until a couple of years ago I couldn't even vote in this country right she just assumed that that was a Democrat. Anyway we've we figured out how to be good neighbors, how to care for each other, look out for each other's houses, shovel each other's driveways and and things like that. So I think that's one part of it, but it's not the it's not the whole part, right? I, I think really on the issue like this, we need to work at both micro and macro, um, micro and macro levels. But seriously, if there are others who have who have ideas about that, I would love to hear them. I'm not seeing any other questions at this point, and we're getting close to the end of our time. So I want to say thank you, Andy, for answering the questions that we've given you today and for giving us a wonderful insight into your work at AMBS. Um, and I want to thank you, alumni, for your ongoing support of AMBS. You are our most important influencers in the church, both of prospective students and donors. So if you know of someone that you would like to consider seminary, please talk to them about it, but also send us their names so that we can be in touch with them. Um, it's really easy now to try one course and see what it's like. We've, we've made that possible for people from all over.